I don't understand it. I think it means we should be starting. Можно. Ага. So is it the beginning, or you are going well to introduce the first slide yourself? Вы уже все, и можно начинать? Нет. Как-то непонятно заставка. Можно, можно начинать. Можно, можно. Окей, вот. То есть уже трансляция идет, правильно, да? Окей. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> some well discussion with our well moderator. My dear colleagues, I'm so happy to see you. And I think it is well, a great event because well, uh, we have never discussed well, the thing, which is well, uh, the topic of our uh, today's dialogue. And it is called well, social processes and their reflection in fiction writing. Uh, and uh, I think that, well, first of all, I should introduce well, our um, participants. Well, let me introduce Professor well, Nadezhda Stoikovic. Well, she is a well, professor of the English language for specific academic purposes. And well, she is from the University of Nish in Serbia, but she is also a visiting <coughs> professor in other places. And uh, she is very much interested well, in the topic. And I can say that, well, in fact, she is also the editor in chief of the journal Teaching English for Specific and Academic Purposes. And I think that, well, the, the great potential of self um, just uh, fiction while writing is also quite an important thing, maybe well, to be even well, included further on and some, as some special item. Well, into our further dialogues and further scientific well, discussions. Let me introduce well, some other people from our faculty. Dubkova Maria, Masha, well, can we see you? I cannot. Well, Hello. so Maria, well, she works well at our faculty and the chair of global communications. Uh, she is a specialist with your PhD in English literature, so she is well, just a person to suit well, the topic of our uh, today's well, discussion. And she is very much interested in modern literature. And her topic will be the image of London in the modern literature. Uh, the next one, well, Natalia Kopeikina, well, she is also a, a person okay. from our faculty. Well, Natasha, happy to see you. Well, just some words about you. Well, she is going well, to deliver your short message uh, on the topic life and death in the novel The Hours. And for me, it is well a very enigmatic well, kind of report because I have never read the thing. And well, the very well name of your well, topic is well, just suggestive. Well, it implies a lot. Your field of interests uh, includes well cognitive linguistics, well, different well things connected with concepts, and of course also uh, English well language teaching is for all people from our faculty. Well, uh, is uh, uh, now will uh, Julia Skalne with us? Cannot see her. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, also Julia Skalne, she is also well, a teacher of our faculty, not a teacher, she is well, of course, a lecturer. And well, um, your topic will also be very, very interesting because well, it will touch upon the retrospect of the Greek well, Turkish War of 1990, 1922. Well, so, and uh, your interests well, are mm, uh, varying well uh, within quite an impressive range of topics. Well, it is philology, literary criticism, history of European literature, and very many well others. Also, she's quite a distinguished well researcher, very much interested in the things. Okay, and well, uh, uh, what about well one more well person? Well, it must be uh, our representative from Tajikistan. Fatima, are you with us? Fatima, maybe to join later? 
well, she must be with us. Well, uh, I'm sure she will be with us a bit later. Maybe well, this is more a problem with some connection from Tajikistan. Well, she is also quite well uh, an interesting person, and she initiated well a reading club at the University of uh, Dushanbe. We are mainly well the students of the first and the second year who well, are involved into research work. And uh, mm, uh, a few words about me. We, I hope that you know me, <laughs> my main interests. Maybe well, I'm the person well, the most remote well, from the field of today's well, discussion, because well, in fact, I am very much interested in the issues of neuro-linguistic programming and well, identity. But when working at some identity issues, well, I understood that if I touch upon um, the uh, spatial factor, well, uh, and if it is well spatial and well uh, also with some civilization values, well, then of course we can speak about geopolitical value, geopolitical factor, and while well, discussing it, well, I came across well quite an interesting well, topic which are called mega projects. And mega projects are the ways well countries, well, big countries like to develop the infrastructure. Well, within their countries, always within their countries. But when the country is well, more or less small, Great Britain, for example, it's fun thing. But when it is uh, United States of America or Russia, of course, well, it is well, something quite well different. And uh, while doing so, and while trying to understand specific features of mega projects, I came across well, some rather interesting well, uh, discoveries for me these were well discoveries because well uh, i understood that many well writers also devoted well, some parts of their works to mega projects and if you don't mind i will start with my presentation i hope i have introduced you into why i have chosen well the thing and uh, while doing so well i just will suggest the following well agenda I'll um, make well my well, presentation. Hope it will not be very long. I did it well at home, and well with me it was well nine minutes. But sometimes well it is longer when you start presenting it well to the audience. Of course, you do understand it. And after that, if well people are interested, well maybe well you can well put one two questions well to everybody, not only to me but to everybody. And uh, uh, but. Uh, we shouldn't be well too long well with the thing and after that we pass to your presentations will i ask you well to present well within the time limit of six minutes if possible well one two minutes well will not be well uh, it will be okay well but um, if more i'll ask you well to finish it somehow and also well one two questions and after that, after well, uh, our well, presentations well, and very short discussion, we are going to have some round table well, discussion where we can well, uh, pay attention to something which was interesting for you and you think that we should well, develop further on and maybe well, prepare well, in some way for our next meeting, which will be in a year. And well, because of well, this well, time, uh, my topic well, was well, social processes and well, fiction writing. I think that maybe next time it should be fiction works, including films, maybe well, some other pieces of um, humanitarian well, uh, researches or works, okay, well, or fiction. Okay, well, so if you don't mind, also, and if you want, you can even well write something well to me, well, as a way of recommendation, how well to improve it all next time. Okay? Okay. Well, uh, and I want to start well my presentation. Okay. And uh, so, just one second. So, I hope you can see it. Can you? Yes, we can. Yeah, yes, you can. Okay. And, well, uh, I'm going, well, to give you, um, uh, to deliver the presentation, which is called English Mega Projects as a Reflection of Social Economic Processes in the State. 
And well, um, I will concentrate, focus on railways. And uh, uh, there was well, a railway boom on the territory of Great Britain, 1925-1942. Of course, well, uh, in my presentation, I use some pictures well, to support well, my material. Some of them are re well, are authentic, and some of them well, were just well taken um, by me well, to illustrate well, the material I, I'm going to deliver. Uh, well, yeah, and well, uh, now I start with the year 18, well, 25. And you can see this wonderful well, picture by a Turner, the elder, well, not well, the one which is famously well represented in the gallery uh, in London, but well, the other one. But well, it's well, quite an interesting thing. And of course, well, it reflects well, the way the first train moved. It was well, Stogham. Stockton and Darlington Railway, and in fact it was to connect the production lines and also the um, mining well facilities in the country, and it was well just an event there. The next was well 18, well 35. Everything is wonderful. La Liverpool and Manchester were connected, and well everybody was well quite happy. It was clear the future was in the train. Pay attention well uh, to the words, uh, to the expressions that exist even nowadays well, in the English language. And for me, it is also well, a sign that this whole well, process, social process, was really important. Because if well, nothing is well left in the language, my point of view, then well, this event was not very relevant at that time and well, further on. And while well, it is with railway speed, well, which means very, very quickly to gain speed or well, to start developing dynamically, dynamically. And well, railway time, well, it is a standard time, which is well nowadays well quite um, well the thing that we're used to, but it has not always been well like that. In 1842, Queen Victoria embarked on rail journey and highly praised well this mode of transport. One more very interesting thing about well, mega projects of Great Britain that they were always somehow well um, uh, uh, were, were somehow well praised by the royal family. Well, princes, uh, princess, and princes. Well, they always well were involved into the matters. Well, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Okay, well, but Queen Victoria. Well, she liked it very, very much. And after that, it was like a snowball. Very soon they appeared, well, very many of them. And well, as usual, different adventurers were involved. The most famous of them is George well, Hudson. Well, and Charles Dickens, well, wrote, well, well uh, gave his po portrait, well, and his well, novel, which is called, well, Little Dorothy. And he was, well, very soon the chairman of York and North Midland Railway. He was, well, the mayor of York. And, well, uh, the aid started buying, leasing, well, planning new well, railway lines. And uh, not giving financial information about it, which very soon, well, developed into the bubble, uh, especially thanks to the so-called, well, creative accounting. He was sure that the main well principles of the state, it is well non-interference in the into the affairs of private firms, will help him in his schemes. He became quite a rich man at that very time. Okay, and all of a sudden it will became real boom. People started well buying things, selling them, well building well things along the projected well route of the railways, and what is very very important, well, all mega projects on the territory of Great Britain and this one in particular, they were outsourced to private companies only. So the state had nothing to do with it. It is well quite a specific feature. English people at that time were absolutely well sure of their well uh, of their superiority over other countries of uh, Europe and the world. 
especially because of their island mentality, being protected from all the others by the seas. And well, very soon they started well to invest a lot of money. They were sure nothing will happen because at that time colonies helped well to develop the country very, very much. And um, very soon, by the year 1845, it became clear that the, the amount of shares issued for the construction 20 times exceeded the overall length of the country from the north to the south. So, well, stupid thing. But well, the speculation will continue. And I have already mentioned that the main reason was well, colonial conquests. And uh, there appeared well, about well, 10 or even more new railway projects every week. And very soon, by the year 1845, well, people started well, making some calculations. And well, the result was that the roads, if all of them were to be built, would have covered the whole world from Ireland to British. Well, Guinea, well, two times, well, impossible, next to impossible. Of course, there was, well, the shock, the bubble burst, and, well, it happened in November, well, 1845. And, well, it was a real tragedy, but what is important, well, nevertheless, the infrastructure, railway uh, uh, infrastructure was still with Great Britain. It helped well to improve the transportation well speed within the country to reduce the cost of it. And after some months, the state well decided that uh, the part of the profits that came from speculations well to the budget of the country should be partly redistributed in favor of the poor. Some introductory thing. But now I want to pay your, uh, your attention to the following thing. Charles Dickens well, wrote a wonderful well, novel which is called Dombey and Son. And well, uh, this is well not well, an authentic well, picture just found on the internet, but I think it should look like that. So what was it like? It looked like it was well, the first shock of a great earthquake. Well, which in fact well, is the, the photo that well, this picture illustrates. Well, this is well, the information. And Mr. Dombey well, came well, to visit his son, who was staying with the nurse well, in the so-called Stags Gardens. And well, he saw that very picture. Well, uh, and uh, if you can well see, well, uh, the uh, um, portrait, well, the image of the situation is very, very vivid. Houses were knocked down, streets broken through and stopped, deep pits, trenches dug in the ground, enormous heaps of earth and clay thrown up. So, well, quite enough. Well, it really well sounds like, well, the shock after an earthquake. And nevertheless, it was the beginning of building the new railway. And uh, it was well, quite, quite interesting. It was not far from London. And that was the thing. All right, three years passes. And Mr. Valdombe well, again well, needs to visit the nurse in the same stacks or gardens. Not authentic. But well, I guess it is well, from some locality that should be well, somewhere there. Well, there was no such place as Tex Gardens because, well, Tex Gardens, it was something not very uh, pleasant, well, with, only with negative connotations. It had vanished from the earth. So no old rotten summer houses. Instead, palaces. And I imagined that they should look like that. And all of this was thanks to this, well, financial boom uh, because of the rail railway construction, railways were construction. Okay, well. And well, there we can well see wonderful things that well now uh, were there. And Mr. Dickens, well, also depicts it in his well book, well, if I'm not mistaken, page 114. 
rich goods, costly merchandise, new streets. Well, and well, so uh, wonderful things as you understand. Well, and well, crowds of people, smartly dressed people, wonderful houses, well, nice villas, uh, gardens healthy public walks which is also quite important and so on so forth okay well uh but of course well it did not last long 40 years passed and now we can see well this is an authentic picture <laughs> in fact the first and that one okay well and we can see that well after 40 years the focus was on something else but well nevertheless some of the houses uh, um, are preserved of course they are not as well wonderful as luxurious as before but nevertheless well there are some of them okay and uh, what's interesting well by 1855 england had the densest rail road network in the world and well uh, all that was good for national identity and well uh, i want uh, and uh, well, i want also to draw your attention to some other well mega projects which are to be continued well <laughs> in my investigations well they were of course south Sea company my god well the, the most interesting thing and in fact well depicted well in stevenson and daniel the fourth well, works well the next Poise, the second one, poise state securities. My God, well, I would never have imagined, well, that English people were so uh, innocent, well, and easy believers. And, well, when they put a lot of money into the thing. Anglo-American Cattle Company, very interesting thing, well, um, uh, thing, well, connected with stock speculations. The Metropolitan Bath Company, another mega project piping seawater to london for those people who cannot afford to travel to resorts lots of money collected and no result london umbrella com company interesting thing also to build stations in london well uh, to issue the umbrellas for rent for a small fee well because well people never know whether to take a sun umbrella or a rain umbrella and so on so forth and i can tell you that well in fact these were well, most important things which are called well mega projects they were depicted well by good english writers on some of their works and uh, i can tell you that before the south sea company was to be launched well um, as uh, a company to have uh, uh, stock tradings well at uh, the london stock exchange mr there appeared well this wonderful well, book about robinson crusoe where they will in some way praised the possibilities of some well far away lands their riches well the pos the opportunities well for some people and besides well in such a way they will stimulate it entrepreneurial spirit within the country as mr dickens has done well he has not well of course well <laughs> tried well to inspire well people well, to do it but nevertheless he gave a wonderful picture or what a mega project can do to some part of the country and this is really very very interesting if you don't well you have never paid attention to charles dickens and well his works of the kind okay well so maybe <laughs> then well it's high time for for you well to pay attention to his works if you have questions i'll be happy to answer them No questions. Okay, if I may ask you a question, maybe not, not based on the material because everything is put out quite clearly. So my question is whether you are going to continue your investigation in terms of uh, fiction proper. So for example, to combine uh, Dickens's point of view on the influence of, of, of the vast projects such as the uh, railway station 
development uh, in uh, Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South. So how the manufacturing development has changed the surface of the North as compared to the South. That's a great idea. But well, Julia, at the moment, well, my, well, my desire is well to see how, well, to compare the way mega projects were developed on the territory of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. Well, so France, United States, and especially Russia. Uh -huh. And if you don't mind, next time I'll give you my information about Ugrium um, Rika. Mm. Well, comparing it with the present well, day work, which is called Zuliha Atkravayat Glaza, if you oh. have read it. Because, well, both of them are devoted well, to discovery of Siberia and especially, well, maybe well exploration of siberia uh, but well the approaches are a bit different and of course they are absolutely different from the way great britain develops it's developed and develops its own mega projects yes that's quite a promising <laughs> thank you I, I wish you all the luck and i will be delighted to hear this yes I, if i have an opportunity thank you mm -hmm. okay also if no further questions, no other questions, well, uh, I'd like well to introduce well, uh, Professor Nadezhda Volstoykovich, and I think that she will tell us something, some, well, she will share some ideas well, concerning well, your topic. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's always been a real pleasure and privilege. Um, I chose to address this topic uh, from a critical standpoint and to uh, and therefore my uh, thesis is to show how works of art and uh, uh, in this case literary works of art but I will just as uh, Professor Kornienko mentioned uh, we have um, uh, entertainment industry nowadays closely related and uh, continuing the work of uh, the impact of literature i will get back to it so uh, how british literature of the past two centuries some of it some works of it uh, contributed uh, intentionally or or without uh, a conscious intent on the part of the author to creating a um, profoundly negative image of the Balkans. I come from the Balkans. So, uh, in a nutshell, my thesis is that fiction writing can be and is sometimes an agent of geopolitics. And we here are the example. Um, I am. Uh, I want to exemplify this thesis to through joy, uh, drawing your attention to a book that is called "Inventing Ruritania, Rural Area, the Land of R Rural." Uh, and the subtitle is The Imperialism of the Imagination. And we heard it with Professor Kornienko, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Imperialism of the Imagination, Robinson Crusoe is an imperialist. Um, this book was written in 1998 by a, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Serbian author, uh, Vesna Goldsworthy. She lives in London. So I, I share her uh, thesis and her argument. <laughs> and my uh, belief is that if you perhaps <clears throat> are willing and uh, you pay attention to that book, maybe it can um, assist you in your own reading of what has been happening on the Balkans. And uh, if I may, uh, uh, I believe and I hope that this current time, the troubles we are experiencing globally in the interpretation of those troubles, um, there is a good side to it 
and I'm connecting it to, to my intention here about my country, Balkans, that we, that all informed people and all good willed people are now more than ever because of what we are exposed to are reflecting and re-examining the interpretation we are being given. The book that I'm uh, talking about is putting forward explanations that prove uh, that there is a narrative colonization. And this narrative colonization is the agent. And I'm again stressing it's intentional or, or not, but uh, it is used in those purposes. So when you think of the Balkans in literature, how it is represented and most, what most famous um, examples are, you of course all remember Byron, uh, you have Dracula on your mind. Uh, you have the murder on the Orient Express, right? So here we are with the murders. But I want you to uh, pay attention to Lawrence Durrell. You all know him. He wrote the, this exquisite novel, The Alexandria Quartet, the um, most refined language of it so yet this man wrote an one book that is not so widely famous and familiar it is called white eagles over serbia now this novel is uh, my primary aim here target i first need to tell you that lawrence darrell um, in, in the period after the Second World War, was um, uh, appointed uh, a foreign correspondent for BBC, and he was in uh, Belgrade. So he was on the spot, and he was moving in the circle of most learned men of Serbia, of the greatest intellectual writers, artists, so he saw the best, and then yet he wrote the novel in which Serbs, from the very first moment you, you encounter the Serbian character to the end, they are put, portrayed as brutes. Um, it is through uh, such presentation presentations, which are found in uh, various pieces of literature, that uh, the perception of audience is formed that Balkans are, is the area, is this exotic, in a negative context, the exotic of Europe, the uncharted, the less familiar, then of course you have less developed, uncultured, the exact opposite of the cultured, developed Europe. It is painful. And uh, I do believe that uh, dialogues that like this um, have this uh, humanistic aim and very possible result in this re-evaluation. We are all uh, exposed to, to receiving uh, unconsciously opinions, impressions about all kinds of things, all areas. Uh, I am aware that I, I, I am uh, certainly unfair in my opinion about some other areas of the world, but 
this is what we can do and I'm glad, therefore glad to have joined this. So uh, the book, Inventing Ruritania, the Imperialism of the Imagination, highly recommended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Nadezhda, is it possible for you well, to um, send us well, the names of these authors and well, also the books either to my email or maybe well, even now well, through chat? Yeah, yeah. I can, I can okay. Well, it will be very interesting because well, sometimes well, not quite well, easy to I understand know. it. Yeah. yeah, okay, well, and well, if uh, you do not mind, well, my dear colleagues, I'll put a question. <laughs> okay, and my question will be the following. Okay, um, your opinion about what is going on in the Balkans and the way you are appreciated by the other part of Europe is quite clear to us. We do understand it. And of course, we highly respect well, Serbia and well, Montenegro for uh, the thing that they are the countries who enjoyed well, independence. Because very many other countries on the Balkans, they were quite happy to be under, under somebody. <laughs> so, under Turkey, well, Austrian well, Empire, well, Italy, well, Ottoman Empire. Even it is well very important. Well, it it will uh, somewhere well in our memory all these things. Well, they go with us. Well, hand in, in hand. Well, through all of our life, and that's why well uh, it is well uh, sometimes very difficult for people who are used well to living well and or being obedient to some other country well to understand other people who want to be really independent and sovereign, and well if you can well, give us well, some um, fiction works where we are which we can read well in uh, russian or in english then it will be very interesting for us and it is very important and one more thing i know that while well, you teach well in well lithuania well maybe my pronunciation of this country is rather old-fashioned i was taught well to pronounce it in this way when i was a student lithuania okay well and well i know that they are very very pro brussel and well uh, uh, do you tell them about well, your views on the matter yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and what is the reaction uh and, you know, the, the reaction is uh, fair. First, they uh, don't understand, but um, for, they don't understand uh, my point because, in fact, they agree. But uh, I'm not speaking to the right audience. So, for example, I was uh, telling them that here in Serbia, we do not like the work of Emil Kusturica, whom Russia likes very much. And they were surprised because they admire him very much. But uh, you see, when uh, his films are presented to Europe or US, uh, which reads Lawrence Darrell exactly in the way Lawrence Darrell wanted to be read, mm -hmm. and Serbs are horrible. Um, they accept it. But if I'm talking to people in academia, they say, no, he's an artist, but you are a minority, the educated mi minority. And the, the wrong is done because the entertainment industry speaks to the majority who, who watch, who watch um, Hollywood movies. And they accept it at face value. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Other questions? Yeah. Other questions, dear colleagues? If not, yeah. Uh, if not, well, Natasha, you are welcome with your short well, report. Well, so it's not well the end of our discussion. Well, to be discussed after all the other well uh, presentations. Well, Natasha, you are welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm honored to be speaking here. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about the images of life and death as expressed in the novel The Hours by Michael Cunningham. And before I do that, I will need to introduce a couple of terms. So the first one is concept. Uh, 
it is a mental unit of our mind and of the informational structure that reflects knowledge and experience of a person. It is a content unit of one's memory, mental access of a person's worldview as reflected in his psyche. Of cognitive terms. Uh, so our conceptual system plays a central role in defining our everyday realities. The next idea I want to talk about was introduced by George Lakoff and Mike Johnson. The nature of our conceptual system is metaphorical. Most people think that metaphor is just a poetic device, but Lakoff and Johnson actually introduced the idea that the way we think, what we experience, what we do every day is very much a matter of metaphor. Uh, generally speaking, a metaphor is when you view one object in terms of another. So to explain what is meant by conceptual metaphor, uh, they adduce an example of uh, the conceptual metaphor, argument is war. And so that is how we speak about arguments. You see, we use a variety of expressions, like your claims are indefensible, his criticisms were right on target. He attacked every weak point in my argument. And uh, so argument is partially structured, understood, performed, and talked about in terms of war. And that is how it is reflected in everyday language. So metaphor is now a very concept of an argument. But today I'm going to talk not about con general but about the universal concepts of life and death and how they are manifested in the novel The Hours by Michael Kahnina. So a couple of things about, well, the novel, the plot. Uh, it describes the lives of three women through the prism of a single day. One of the characters is Virginia Woolf, who is writing her novel Mrs. Galloway. Another character is Laura Brown, who is a housewife in Los Angeles in 1949, and she's reading the novel. And the third uh, character is Clarissa Woon, who is a 50-year-old woman. She lives in New York at the end of the 20th century, and she's throwing a party for her dying friend, Richard, who calls her Mrs. Dalloway. So they are interconnected. Uh, the concepts of life and death are immensely important in the metasemiotic structure of the novel. First of all, it is shown by the plot itself, because the novel starts with Virginia Woolf committing suicide in 1941. Then Richard, Clarissa's friend, is terminally ill, and at the end he commits suicide. And Laura Brown becomes obsessed with the idea of suicide. And though she does not commit it, it influences her life and her worldview. Uh, on the contrary, Clarissa Vaughan loves uh, life and the world. And so the characters often think about life and death, and how they are presented in the novel is unique. Uh, one can talk about that in detail, yeah, but it would take a long time. So those are the conceptual metaphors that exist in the novel. Uh, so you see there is a number of them, and usually life and death are opposed to each other. I will speak about one of them, so the first one. Life is ordinariness and death is talent. Uh, so in the conceptual sphere of the novel, committing suicide is connected with having talent and genius, while living and loving life is associated with ordinariness. And that is true for all the three main characters. So in the first scene of the novel, Clarissa is going to buy some flowers for the party. And that is what she thinks. Say like the first quote. Yeah, I will not read it aloud. Yeah, of course, well, you can see it. So you mm -hmm. see she calls herself an ordinary person. And this word ordinary has got quite negative connotations, even if we look at the definitions. Yeah, so it means, according to Longman Dictionary, like average, common, not different or special, or even not particularly good or impressive. And uh, so it is negative here. And later on, she thinks that she loves Richard, her friend, who is dying. 
but perhaps she loves that day slightly more. And she feels a bit ashamed about uh, well, being so enthusiastic and cheerful. Uh, and so uh, love and life feels ordinary and even indecent for her. Uh, in the minds of the other characters, uh, Laura Brown and Virginia Woolf, death is connected even more strongly with being special, not ordinary, talented. Uh, when uh, the idea of committing suicide begins to form in Laura, Laura Brown's mind, she thinks about the reaction of her friends and family, and she says that they would say, oh, we thought she was all right, we thought her sorrows were ordinary ones, we had no idea. And here again, this word ordinary, and later on she repeats it. So if she decides to die for herself, she becomes opposed to something ordinary so she becomes different from the world that she is leaving behind and later on she keeps thinking about that when she returns home and she hates her routine her daily life and so she draws a distinct line between being common and being talented and for virginia wolf the third character it is even more prominent so uh let me yeah those are Quotes. So when she thinks about her novel, she uh, is sure that one of the characters must die, and she decides that it's not going to be Clarissa's, but a greater mind than Clarissa's. Someone with sorrow and genius enough to turn away from the seductions of the world. It's cups and codes. So cups and codes are what she's talking about with her sister when she is thinking about that. And they symbolize the how ordinary life is and how common and death is connected with being talented gifted and it is impossible for them to tolerate the world and this is expressed even more vividly in the next quote yeah, so the last one here uh, and so you see the conceptual field of the novel is quite unique and it uh, well supports the uh idea that life is much more complicated than it seems and yeah i think i'm going to stop here thank you okay thank i'll you. be happy to answer any questions to my friend. so dear colleagues do you have questions i always have but well uh, i'm about putting questions too often maybe what well, some other people can do well would like to do it Natasha, well, if mm -hmm. nobody is quite eager to put questions, then I am. Also, uh, what accounts for your choice of the topic? Because, well, I, I'll clarify, well, my, um, well, uh, what is behind, well, my idea. Um, when I try, well, uh, to analyze the content of some internet sources, well, I see, I clearly see that they are the idea of infagidon, twittagidon, also according well, to the same model as my armagidon, well, they are well met everywhere. Then, well, so it is well, um, instead of globalization, co calculization, also weaponization, well, and also weapon organization well like that well so uh, in well some western mass media i've got well and well including internet well and i've got an impression that they are in western mass media and internet well people are very much well frightened do you think that well these will speculations i will say that these are speculations around well the concepts of death and life are also within the same semantic field or you have a bit different opinion about the matter. Uh, well, excuse me, well, maybe well, a bit philosophical well, thing, <laughs> philosophical it's question, but well, fine. Uh, it's interesting. Thank you. Uh, well, I would say that you could uh, view uh, the, well, the concepts and the ideas themselves of life and death at different levels. And if uh, you speak about uh, the hours of the novel, there it is more, well, a more on the one hand, more personal level, like connected with the characters' lives, and on the other hand, more philosophical ones. So it is about psychology, uh, 
and psyche rather of than the so called uh, broken society. society. Because, well, in healthy society, people usually do not well uh, discuss the matter very much. Well, uh, my point of view, maybe, will a bit straightforward. <laughs> I would say it's the other way around because it is honest to discuss these matters because it's something uh -huh. that everybody faces, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Well, Nadezhda, well, you're welcome with your question. Uh, I just uh, want to add uh, a term and that is balkanization. So possibly um, relevant and interesting for uh, investigation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Well, so the next one will be Julia. Well, Julia, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Unfortunately for today, I haven't uh, had enough time to prepare the presentation, but I hope if I have enough time to show a little video after my text. So my subject is a little bit digressing uh, from uh, the concept of a death per se into the process of how people might deprive themselves of life or their enemies, so the process of war. So a contemporary retrospect of the Greco-Turkish War of 1919 and 1922 in Demosthenes Papa Marcus's short story collection Gyak. Ancient Greek civilization and especially the Hellenistic culture which spread the best achievements of classical Greece around Asian territories is still largely considered to be the great of the European civilization. There are several dates, though, that marked crises of the Greek civilization. The Achaean War of 146 BC, which eventually turned Greece into one of the Roman colonies. The fall of Constantinople of 1453, which uh, caused Greece to be uh, the uh, colony of the Turkish, and also the so-called Asia Minor disaster of 1922. The latter was the outcome of the unsuccessful military campaign undertaken by the Greeks in 1919, which initiated the second Greek-Turkish war and unfortunately ended in the loss of Smyrna and the overall defeat of the Greek army. The failure of that campaign marked not only the most dramatic and devastating experiences in Greek history involving the Pontic genocide of Greek people of Anatolia and forced population exchange between Greece, Turkey and Bulgaria as a result of signing the 1923 Lausanne Convention, but also the end of the Hellenistic culture domination in Asia Minor. Up to date, these events have not been widely discussed in Greek literature as they still provoke bitter pain of collective trauma. Still, analyzing history and learning from the past remains the best approach to understanding the present. Realizing it, contemporary author Demosthenes Papamarchus, who was born in 1980, Three, has combined scientific and literary approach to speak about what has been considered unspeakable for the broadest sense of the word in his collection of short stories, Gyak. Being a writer and a scriptwriter, Papa Marcus presents each story as a one-sided dialogue where the reader finds himself or herself practically eavesdropping on a very intimate conversation which meant not was not meant for their ears. It is usually a confession about a crime, a scene, or something that the speaker considers to be neither of those, but still prefers to keep it secret. Although all characters are fictional, their realistic nature is beyond doubt due to the historical act accuracy with which Papa Marcus depicts the events, uh, the households, and actually the people's reaction, and the way they speak. Actually, in 2013, uh, while he was working on his thesis on ancient history in Oxford University, he went on a journey around Asia Minor, which inspired him to create this short story collection, which was published the year uh, the next year. So uh, the narrative discourse is always first person except for the ballad, uh, which is uh, a little bit a kind of a digression from the main narrative because it is purely metaphorical. Although stylistically it is based in the national folklore songs, still uh, it bears too much relation to the mythology because the main figure there is Charon, yeah, so the god of death. We all know that initially in Greek mythology Charon was just the carrier of the souls through the waters of um, 
uh, Hades. But still, in the later development of mythological consciousness, he has become the representation of death. And it is quite interesting that from the uh, modern perspective, uh, Papa Marcus makes an opponent for this representation of death as a woman, not as a man, not as a soldier, as opposed to all the other stories. Actually, in this case, it is a woman, a widow, who withstands all the uh, seduction that Karen offers her in order to take her to the Hades. Uh, he even tries to represent himself as her husband who has come alive, but still she withstands him and thus represents the regaining of the power of social position of women at the time. So continuing with the uh, historical narrative, so what can we see here? Uh, each story in Papa Marx's collection is told by a male character, each of them being born in the same region and belonging to the group of Arvanites. Arvanites are a bilingual population in Greece of Albanian origin, which came to Greece in the 12th to 15th centuries, and since then has assimilated to an extent where there is no conflict or contradiction between the substrate Arvanite Albanian culture and their Greek cultural tradition. And the choice of this ethnical group uh, of the protagonists is also very characteristic because uh, on the one hand, it shows Hellenization in the proper sense of the word, but uh, on the other hand, it also creates a sharp contrast with the events of the Greek War of Independence of 1829 to 1821 uh, to 1829, where the Arvanites played a significant role in liberating the Greek nation from the Ottoman Empire, while in the 20th century, they had to be defeated. So currently, Arvanitica is an endangered language, and the fact that that Papa Marcus largely employs it in his stories serves also as an homage to another rich culture finding itself on the verge of extinction. And on the other hand, uh, it also evokes the problems of endangered cultures and languages and minor ethnical communities in the face of globalization. The Arvanites have their own idea of justice, and this actually gives the name, the title to the book, Gyak. So here as it. Yes, uh, in our Russian translation. So uh, this word in Arvanitika means the blood that should be spilled to take revenge for a murdered relative and is codified in the book of laws called the Canon. This book has existed orally since the 15th century and was written down only in the 20th century. As critic Dione Dimitridad notices in his review of the book, quote, the stories of Gyag ooze with blood. The words sound harsh and stripped of any superficial appeal. There is no attempt to make it seem there might be any excuse to politicize such brutality. And what strikes the reader the most is not only the atrocious deeds themselves, but that accomplice detachment with which those who commit these crimes present their stories. So not only the character's detachment in, is striking, but also the overall non-judgmental character of the narrative itself. It seems that the, present of the presence of the author per se is nowhere to be sensed. On the other hand, we should not forget that the concept of blood revenge is deeply rooted in the ancient consciousness. To a large extent, it is correlated with the Germanic and Scandinavian Vergelt or Fergelt, uh, or the notorious Italian Vendetta. And considering the amount of violence that the contemporary world, world is still facing, it can be well said that humanity still hasn't completely eradicated that concept, if ever we'll be able to. So the idea yeah, and... Yeah. Okay, well, somehow, welcome. Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm going to. So... Um, uh, the idea and practice of Gyak as shown in Papa Marcus's story collection does not bear any sign of third party criticism. As far as impartiality is concerned, Papa Marcus's position reminds that of Homer, who presents the events of the Trojan War from such inner distance that allowed him to show both the glory and the more morally flawed aspects of hero's behavior. Take, for example, Achilles' sardonic desecration of over Hector's body and refusal to give it back to his father unless he pays the enough amount of gold for the weight of the corpse. And so the very first story of Yak is given from the same point of view. Here we have a brother who has lost his sister. She was brutally beaten and symbolically abused and dishonored. Her gorgeous braids were cut off and so thrown away. So what he does is exactly the same thing. He finds the man who is guilty of that crime and he tortures him until the, he slowly becomes a dead corpse and he still couldn't just overcome that feeling of disjustness. So 
However, in Pope Marcus's representation, the war is deprived of any kind of Homeric aura of stoic and glorious heroism. It is depicted more in the traditions of Remark, Barbus, Celine, and other writers of the lost generation. As Dimitris Yalama says, the editors um, can see that characters here are both executioners and victims. And although they are mainly the soldiers who participate in the Greek and Turkish War of 1919-1922, all events in the short stories could have taken place in any war with any enemy at any moment in history. Papa Marcus writes about the unknown soldier having come back from the war, which releases the cruelty in human beings. He highlights the peripheral states when the soldier comes back to his own town, village, to his family, but continues to bear all the wildness of bloody massacres inside him. And eventually he becomes not just the avenger, but the man trapped in the archetypal instinct, the, the, the slaughterer of the personal enemies and the butcher in the times of peace. For Greek literature, I'm finishing, sorry. So for Greek literature, the matters of this future have always been deeply connected to its history to the history of language and to the history of people in general. Due to the considerable periods of Turkish and Ottomanic occupation, literary innovations as a rule start with a retrospect in the ancient times and the language classical poets. So Demosthenes Papa Marcus does precisely the same thing. Instead of focusing on major historic personalities, battles, archival statistics, he pays attention to the individual stories of common, sometimes nameless people whose private histories contribute to the global historical process. And in the post-truth era, that kaleidoscopic approach of combining, juxtaposing, and mixing multiple subjective perspectives is the only powerful current of emotion experience seems to be the most objective way to reconstruct the past to see our beastly nature, but still give hope to our humane aspect and prepare for the challenges of the modern world. Thank you. Sorry for the overcoming the limit. Thank you very much. Of course, well, quite an interesting well, message. Well, the one well delivered with great emotion. Well, I understand that you are taking sides with the author of the book. I'm absolutely sure of it. My question is very short. And well, it is like that. Well, you have well, you have delivered well the atmosphere of the book to us. Mm -hmm. well, so maybe well, not the details. It is not necessary. Well, but the atmosphere itself. And well, my nevertheless, my question is the following one. Okay. Well, my husband likes to watch well, American films. Well, piles of dead enemies. Okay, well, so, well, <laughs> the cars are not spared. <laughs> Broken cars everywhere, also piles. Well, uh, the well, gun is, well, just well, working all the time and so on and so forth. And, well, you lose, well, this feeling that it is, well, something terrible, that it is tragedy. Also, the way you presented it, well, I have an idea that it is, well, absolutely different. That, well, maybe, well, not so many well killed enemies, but much more attention is, well, paid, well, to the way the author understands, well, how he should, well, um, defend his identity individual identity well in different forms and also well, maybe well in a more generalized way the identity of all the people that have been well insulted by uh, by the enemies of, uh, that you have also well uh, is it yeah. Yeah, well, am I right, well, to have such an impression? Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Actually, despite the fact that it is not, not a very large book, it's a very little one, all the stories are pretty short. And not a popular one. Yeah, no, yes, definitely, because it has just been translated. Actually, you will be surprised if you take a look at the amount of Greek authors who have been translated into Russian over the 20th century, you count one or two. Whereas in the latest, in the last decade, we have several authors with very wonderful short novels, collection stories, etc. And these are fascinating things to read, definitely. So speaking about Demosthenes Papamakos, this book is a tough reading. And uh, not only this is my personal opinion, this is also the opinion of the critics, because uh, this impartiality with which he presents all these atrocities. Uh, but um, at the same time, his idea is not, not to entertain in any way. So not like the American uh, 
movies. movie. Yes, and his idea is not to just like <laughs> cover your cover you in mud and blood, and so just to feel guilty for yourself. No, so his idea is to show how ordinary people who has the who have the idea of justice, who feel themselves humane, who have families, who love, who continue to love, still uh, face the moment when uh, they have lost something inside them. And so the people whom they consider to be enemies and uh, horrible creatures killing the, the ones whom they loved, uh, they, they are these people now. And so they cannot overcome it. They cannot do anything about themselves. And despite the Thank fact... You. Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Well, Nadezhda, I'm absolutely sure. This is well the topic will connect it with the Balkans. <laughs> Maybe, well, you have well, some well, remarks or you have questions? No, I, I'm enjoying this very much and uh, especially the information about the book itself. And uh, I appreciate the, the stance of both the author and, and Julia. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, and, and well, uh -huh. uh, just, just a second. So actually, what I wanted to show the video, but I don't have enough time, so I won't do yeah. this. I will just give you a link. So there is oh. a, a, even a, a production, a theatrical production based on this uh, short story collection. So oh, it will be very interesting. Well, our chat is waiting for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, Masha Dubkova, you are welcome. Well, and after, um, and I guess that after your report, we have some, well, uh, 10, well, maybe, well, 15 minutes for this discussion okay mm -hmm. masha you're welcome so i hope you can can you hear me well and yeah yeah okay great thank yeah. you it's a great pleasure to be here today thank you very much for all those wonderful books wonderful stories um and from greece to london i wonder if i can show the presentation can i I'm sorry. Так, here. Совместный доступ. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I know that. Just... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, today I'm going to talk about London in the modern literature, and I'm going to talk to give a talk about three authors. The first two are on the screen peter Ackroyd, london the biography but also he has a number of works on um london londoners biography of london history of london whatever and edward to their uh, i would like to begin with Ackroyd. uh for long period of time london has been the center of politics trade science you name it Many artists were in, inspired and impressed by this magnificent place. Uh, Peter Eckert has written an impressive number of works on cities and people in it. He implies that London has its own genius loci that dominates the place and the citizens. His London is a very traditional city with the areas changing their form but not the purpose. Pagan temples are um, replaced by churches for example but the spirit remains the same uh the same goes uh, for shops workshops whatever um in accurate books um we see that um no one feels excluded but to be more objective accurate focuses on a very specific type of people who he calls visionaries he writes about Chaplin, Dickens, Turner, and others. In his novels, not biographies, but novels, we can see Dan Lino, a creator of Gollum. So his London is full of creativity and artistic flair. Uh, in this, the city uh, seems quite hom homogeneous, homogeneous, quite consistent with what Ackroyd represents himself. A similar idea is represented in Edward Rutherford's novel, uh, also named uh, London. And uh, as you probably know, Rutherford uh, writes uh, historic novels uh, devoted to places. Ireland, London, even Moscow, as far as I understand, but I haven't read it yet. 
Um, yes, London is about the rivalry of two families that had started even before the London was built itself, but continues over the century. Uh, and like Eckhart, he's more concentrated on trade and uh, politics, not art. His London evolves from wooden huts to stone houses. It grows and becomes stronger, maybe even more threatening, as well as his characters. Uh, and their rivalry from daily arguments uh, grow into something really atrocious. Um, Rutherford um, also touches upon religion, which is a very rare topic in uh, Eckhart's novels and books. But I think that's because in uh, Rutherford's novel, uh, religion is a mean of um, being more powerful, getting power. Um, however, uh, there is a more recent novel, Sebastian Folks, A Week in December. Uh, and London in this novel is uh, very different from what we saw in Eckhart and Fox books. Sorry, uh, Eckhart and Rutherford books, sorry. Um, we see a young girl who uh, works in the underground. We see a Muslim family of uh, who, live, who have lived a lot of time, of, for a long time in Scotland, but then they moved to London as their father became more prosperous. Um, the, the son in this family is rebellious. He is part of the underground organization, organization who would like to blow up London. Um, and we also see a tycoon, a banker, who plans to destroy the banking system uh, by some stock operation, as far as I remember. Um, and uh, in this novel, London is very heterogeneous. We see that the person is opposed to system at all levels, from the very low ones, like this girl who is persecuted because she is not, uh, she hasn't stopped um, the train on time, and Amanda uh, then this son who wants to who, who's preparing the terroristic act and this banker who wants to undermine the whole banking system uh, and most people are paused in someone else's game i'm sorry not on time oh, i'm sorry um you'd better switch off the sound no, sorry, that's, that was mine, unfortunately. It's, it's a home phone. Mm -hmm. uh, what strikes most about this novel is its thrilling atmosphere. The underground terrorist organization is less frightening than um, that uh, uh, a simple dialogue between two bankers who, want, uh, who are planning their nefarious operation. Uh, the conflict between the system and the individual persists. This is the topic that Eckhart and Rutherford hardly touch upon. To sum up, I'd like to say that each author here has their own London, although some features are, of course, similar. Many writers focus on the historical uh, aspect, like Rutherford and Eckhart. Uh, as this allows them to explore the image of London created by their predecessors, so their city is quite homogenous. Those who are more interested in the modern, uh, in, in the modern London, London of today, they prefer to, to illustrate the heterogeneity of the place. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, well, mm, there were some interruptions. There was well, some well, background noise while you were speaking. Oh, but well, nothing doing about it. Well, sometimes the connection is not perfect. Okay, well, so uh, questions, well, my dear colleagues. Uh, so, 
Uh -huh. Maybe I, just a little addition, maybe not a question uh, if uh, Masha has already read the book or if not, I don't know. So uh, Sebastian Fox, as far as I know, has published a, a recent novel which is called Parisian Echo, where you have uh, also the main opponent of London in literature like Paris. So uh, if you have read the book, definitely say, uh, is the approach to the city different? And if not, that's just a matter to discuss later. No, I think we, we will discuss it later as I haven't read this book yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you All very right. much. This is something to exploit later. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Masha, well, <clears throat> so, well, uh, I'll tell you honestly and sincerely that when well, I suggested this topic of discussion, I was, well, I, I had, well, the following idea or well, somewhere behind in my thoughts that while well, fiction writing is the most objective tool that will help us well, to see what were social processes that took place well in this or that will place well at this uh, at well, some definite period of time and while well, uh, you tried well to see it a bit differently well so that everyone has well his or her image of the London and well, the way well uh, you live there. Is it possible well to get some kind of collective image of the thing of London, of its well, atmosphere, of all the processes well which are taking well place well in the city? Well, when you are investigating well, uh, uh, well fiction writing. So well, do, do you understand my idea? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking uh, now when I'm thinking about it, I think that this task is really global and it will take a lot of time and maybe sometime in the future, the, uh, in the, um, the literary critics, the people who are interested might make up the whole picture of what's happening. But now we can see only bits and pieces. And um, I think that uh, each uh, writing, be it documentary or fiction, uh, is highly subjective and it's, um, you have to, um, how to put it, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, you have to read and analyze um, a huge number of novels and books to get the bigger picture. Okay, well, so it's it's difficult well to have it to have a complete mosaic. Maybe with the big data yeah. we can, but it's <laughs> yeah, okay, well. complicated. Thank you. Well, so okay. for Tima, oh my God, well, I have uh, forgotten. Well, Shalmoeva, well, uh, the woman, well, who is well, quite an interesting woman from well, Dushanbe, from Tajikistan, at the moment, well, is in the hospital. That's why well, she cannot well join us. And well, I think it is well, we have well enough time well to discuss it in between ourselves. And well, I'll. Uh, tell my impression from our, our conversation on some dialogues. Well, I enjoyed it very, very, very much. I think it was well, quite an interesting thing. Well, and uh, I'm sure that, well, I will judge it as successful. From my point of view, it was well, quite successful. Thank you very much for your contribution. Okay, well, uh, and well, some well, thoughts that I have well, in mind, well, just now about, well, the way to further develop our approach, well, to social processes and, well, fiction writing. I think that, well, maybe we should not, well, uh, include the only speakers well, who know the English language. I think that maybe next time it is also, we, we should welcome also people, well, who speak some other languages, well, and nevertheless have, well, for example, slides in their presentation in the English language. It will enlarge our audience because at the moment, well, there were some restrictions and I had to obey to them. Okay, this is one thing. And well, another thing, well, I just want to say that while well, we are from the uh, Faculty of Global Studies, <laughs> and while well, we are from the uh, chair, which has is has the name of global communications. Well, and well, it is also well very very important. Well, what I mean is that well, we should nevertheless well try well to come to some well, at least small generalization maybe and one more thing that well i hope that after our next meeting in a year 
we have a kind of an additional kind of a book, which is a set of our articles devoted to these whole topics, well, which will be edited at the, which will be published at our faculty. I have already discussed it with uh, the uh, leadership of our faculty. So well, I hope that well, this year and next year we develop well, some small bits of mosaic. Well, each of us will our own will be, okay, and after that, well, maybe next well, year when we'll have more material, we'll have it somehow well, uh, in form of some, in some book well, ready for being published. Also, this is well, my opinion because well, I'm absolutely sure that we had well, some very brilliant well, presentations and well, we should not just well, listen to them once and not well, have them fixed. That's my idea. You are welcome well, to share your opinions and your approaches. I'm not well, going to say you speak, you speak. No, <laughs> just well, share your ideas. I would like to thank you, Olga Irina, and every participant because it was a really delightful conversation and a wonderful dialogue and provided a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, well, so, <laughs> no, maybe it was... So I would also like to thank you and all the speakers. It was wonderful that we looked at so many sides, you know, of the subject, and there is still so much more to investigate further. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, Nadezhda, well, do you want to say something? Yes, definitely. Uh... I agree with uh, Maria and Natalia, and of course with you. And um, I, I do believe that uh, this is um, an important uh, endeavor, an important initiative, and having it uh, somewhere more permanently would be expected. The fact that you are mentioning some publication yes well i think that well speaking is one thing but well okay. when you have it published it is well something well absolutely different mm -hmm. right okay well and i think that at the moment we do not have enough information for the thing but well maybe oh. in a year when okay. people know okay. about it and they work well uh with some idea already in mind well they can well we can well give some wonderful results and one more thing also uh, in a year approximately at that time well plus to well the scientific well science festival will also have the so-called well great well congress <laughs> well i guess well it is again congress and this is the congress well which is devoted to the um, arctic region arctic region and well i suggested well the topic from our chair which well sounds well uh, like that well it is well so the threat of indigenous communities well uh, near the arctic in the arctic region also if you have any ideas well maybe well you can join well, of course, I'm going. Well, I'll send it well to people. It will be included into the agenda, into the program of this whole well, congress. I do not know whether many people will join us or not. But if you have ideas, if you well, think that it is well important, well, no, to help well some well, other people not to lose their identity when there are such well grand well. Uh, or grand <laughs> mega project. So I think it is also rather important. And well, it's an additional opportunity for us well, to have a meeting. Um, yeah. May well, I ask, uh, maybe it sounds unrelated, but um, I really appreciate the, the variety of work that you are doing and uh, going into so many directions. Uh, I must first of all praise that because um, the the content the contacts that i have in europe primarily they are uh, colleagues are focused on one area mm -hmm. so if somebody is doing cognitive linguistics they they wouldn't be joining talk or, or conference on uh, related to literature so i i am delighted to to, to be immersed in the environment that is not limited 
because I, I truly believe it is the complete opposite of what education is. Advance is in diversity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, all colleagues. Well, so uh, I will appreciate if you will write to my email well, and send some proposals, maybe we'll share new ideas so that well, we can somehow um, have the feeling that it is not just well, blah, blah talking, but well, that it is well, something which, well, which has perspective. Well, some great perspectives, maybe. Well, and well, it will. Um, it will eventually become fruitful. Definitely. Yeah, okay, well, so thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> so, well, our well, dialogue is over. We are very good girls because, well, we had the time limit one hour, 30 minutes, and we have five minutes more if you want, well, to communicate, well, <laughs> with uh, each other. Okay, well, so you're welcome. Maybe Olga, you...